Okay, so this is lecture two for September 8th. I think this will be the last lecture for today. But uh, you'll have hopefully filled out the sheet on the first page of the problems of the articles. And then we'll talk more about the Constitutional Convention in this lecture. I mentioned to you that these important figures from American political life had met at John, James Madison's uh, instigation in Philadelphia, summer of 1787. George Washington is the president of the Constitutional Convention. And Madison quickly convinced a majority of the delegates that they couldn't revise the Articles of Confederation. They were a train wreck. Well, that's a little early. Don't have trains yet. But they were a disaster that had to be scrapped. And a brand new government created. Now, one of the things that Madison was convinced of is that confederation would not work. Confederation is the idea of having essentially independent states that form a club for very limited purposes. This way of thinking about the United States under the Articles of Confederation was really the countries are New York and New Hampshire and Georgia. Those are the countries and the United States of America is an, an association, a confederation of those nations. It's not really thinking of the United States as one united nation. It's more like the NATO military alliance of today in some ways. It's a little stronger than that, but not much. Instead, what James Madison envisions is a federal system. A federal system. Now, a federal system is two-leveled. On one level, you have the government of the states over their own people in their own territory. Each state has a fully functional government that looks after the needs of its peoples, that governs its peoples, regulates their lives. And within each state, those states have great power. But a federal system says there is a second tier of government, the federal government, that is itself a sovereign government over the whole nation. So the Madison's idea was a federal system would have a federal government that had genuine and fairly strong powers over the whole of the United States of America. But there would also be the 13 state governments, and then more when they were ready, that would have real sovereignty over the lives of their peoples in everything the federal government did not control legitimately. Okay? You get the idea? The federal government is going to have real strong powers, but they will be limited to certain areas and if the federal government doesn't have control of those areas under the Constitution, it's up to the states to control them. All right? There will also be what are known as concurrent powers. These are where the states and the federal government both have power to govern in a certain area. They both can act. So, for example, one concurrent power would be to punish intentional murder. But the federal government's power to punish intentional murder is limited to murder committed in the process of violating a federal crime, a federal law, okay? If there wasn't a federal law being broken while the murder is committed, the federal government can't punish the alleged murderer. I mean, if you saw, you know, some neighbor who just said, I'm going to kill my wife, and they walked into their house and shot her, this would not be a federal crime. It would, the state of Texas would punish him for murder, not the federal government. Because normal circumstances, shooting somebody in your own home is not a federal crime. It's a state crime. 
the state of Texas would punish that murderer. They would go to state court, be convicted, and sent to state prison to serve for violating a state crime. On the other hand, if they said, I'm going to go shoot that federal DEA agent and kill him, then the federal government could punish him because he has attacked a federal officer in the performance of his duties. That would be a federal crime, and he could be executed under the laws of the United States of America, not just the state of Texas. Incidentally, it's also a state crime in Texas. How about that? The guy who went berserk in that El Paso Walmart last year, remember that? Shot all those people? He is being tried right now in the state of Texas courts for murder, for murdering those people. I think it was 14 of them. But when he's done with that, then the feds are going to try him for violating the civil rights of those people because it was pretty clear he was targeting Hispanic people. It was a racist attack, and that is a violation of federal civil rights statutes. Statutes, <laughs> sorry. So you can commit the same act, and it is both a state crime and a federal crime, punished by both. They usually work out who's going to go after the bad guy first. In this case, the federal government said, let the state of Texas try him first, because our punishments are more severe. I mean, unless he's found to have some mitigating circumstances like mental illness, which is what he's alleging, he would probably get the death penalty in Texas, but he probably he wouldn't be able to get that in the federal statutes. So anyway, but the point being, in a federal system, there is a federal government, which governs the entire nation, all 50 states today. It has real powers and strong powers, but those powers are particular You'll see the Constitution lays out in Article 1 the enumerated powers, the things the federal government has the power to control. And the Tenth Amendment tells us that anything the federal government isn't expressly given control over is a power reserved to the states, not the federal government. Now, the state governments are real powerful governments. In fact, most of the things that govern your daily life aren't controlled from Washington, D.C. They're controlled from Austin. All right? You get in your car and you start driving recklessly or you're speeding. It is going to be a state licensed police officer who pulls you over and cites you for violating a state law. Okay? Um, unless you're robbing a bank, if you went in and robbed a 7-Eleven, you're violating a state law. You're trying in state court, you go to state prison. Okay? So most of the things that affect our day-to-day -day lives are actually under state jurisdiction. But some things are under federal jurisdiction. The federal system is two-tiered. A national level and a state level. And that was new. Because the Articles of Confederation, basically the state, the federal, the, the national government, you can't call it federal government, the national government was almost powerless. So Madison at the Constitutional Convention worked on and persuaded enough people that the new government, the new Constitution should create a federal system with real powers in the national government. Their argument was. The, the, the Confederation Articles, the national government such as we have is ridiculously too weak. Now, there were people who were worried about the states losing too much power, and that's going to be part of the, the give and take of the negotiating process. How much power are the states going to have left when we're done with this? How much is going to the federal government? It will be very carefully negotiated. But there will be a separate level of government with its own separate institutions at the national level, the federal government. Now, the federal government Madison proposed, and this becomes known as the Virginia Proposal because Madison was from Virginia. The Virginia Proposal is to create a three-branch government, Madison's idea. There will be a legislative branch, Congress, and you'll remember the legislative branch makes the laws. Congress is the legislative branch. There will be an executive branch to enforce 
federal law. After a little hemming and hawing, they decided to call the chief executive officer of the executive branch the president of the United States. So there's a Congress and a presidency. But remember, one of the big problems with the articles was if you want to do interstate commerce, you had to sue somebody in their own home state. If it wasn't your state, you were at a huge disadvantage. So Madison proposes an entire federal court system so that there is a federal law enforced by federal judges that are supposed to not be beholden to the state governments or the state voters or anything particularly state-related. They are federal government officials to enforce federal law. Or you could sue somebody in another state under the state laws of that state, but you would be getting a Im more impartial federal judge. And this is complicated. This kind of stuff you have to learn about in the first year of law school. I'm not going to expect that kind of in-depth knowledge out of you guys in high school. But just know that the federal court system is there to try to take away the home field advantage of the local guy in his own state court. Try to make a more national level playing field for everybody in interstate disputes. So there's a Congress, a legislative branch, that's the Congress, an executive branch with a president, and a federal court system in the federal court that's being created by the Constitution. Now, Madison's Virginia plan imagined some major changes to the way Congress had worked under the Articles of Confederation. For one thing, under the Articles of Confederation, there was just one House of Congress. There were 13 states with one vote each. And by the way, I forgot to mention this last time, important decisions on most things had to be unanimous. All 13 states had to agree before they would be passed. How likely is that to happen, right? Really hard to get 13 just regular people to agree about something. Um, Getting politicians with different interests from different parts of the country together to agree, very hard. So what Madison proposes is breaking the Congress from one house to two, an upper house of Congress and a lower house of Congress. The upper house of Congress was to be called the Senate. He's calling on the name of the ancient Roman Senate. He really was a student of Roman history. And he thought the Romans had wisely created this body of wiser, older men. And then back then it was all men. And then there was the lower house, which was going to be bigger and closer to the people. Now, how does he do that? For one thing, he sets different age requirements to be elected, to be chosen to either body. To be a member of the Senate, and you might remember from your Roman history, that actually means Council of Elders, you had to be an older individual. You had to be 30 years old to be selected to serve in the Senate. To be able to serve in the House of Representatives, you only had to be 25. The youngest member of the House of Representatives right now is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm sure you've heard of her. Uh, I believe she's now 27. She might have just turned 28. So it's not common today for people in their 20s to be elected to Congress, but it does happen in the House of Representatives. The lower house is called the House of Representatives. The Senate, you have to be 30 to be chosen. The House of Representatives, you have to be 25. The Senate was meant to be a smaller body of wiser, older men in Madison's vision. And the common people did not directly select them in his idea. When the Constitution was written, the senators were chosen by the state legislatures of each state. They were not voted by the common voters. You voted for your state legislator, and then your state legislator chose who the senator would be. This was because Madison was kind of an elitist. He thought your average person wasn't really all that smart and might be too swayed by emotions. And so you had political leaders who had been voted by the voters could sit in more quiet deliberation and wisely choose an older man to serve in the Senate. 
The House of Representatives, on the other hand, will be the people's representatives. These are ones that every citizen who can vote gets to vote for. The Senate was to be a smaller number of people, a few wise men. The House, many more people, closer to the people, elected from much smaller districts. So in Virginia, there would be a dozen Senate, dozen House of Representatives members. So that was Madison's basic idea. Older, smaller body selected by the state legislatures in the Senate. The House of Representatives closer to the people, more members directly elected by the electors. I should put an asterisk by that though, friends. You will remember that in 1780s, women could not vote. Actually, technically, a few women could vote in New Jersey, but it, that would quickly end. Women were disenfranchised almost everywhere. Obviously, enslaved people, and there were still slaves in every state at the time, could not vote. The voting age for males was 21. And every state at that time, to be a voter, you had to own property or pay rent of a certain amount on property. You couldn't be dirt poor, you couldn't be too young, you couldn't be female, and you couldn't be not a free person. You didn't get to vote if you were any of those things. Only free white men of a certain financial status over the age of 21 could vote. So the vast majority of people in the country could not vote. But if they could vote, they got to vote for that 25 year and older person in the House of Representatives. Otherwise, under Madison's plan, and this is what was adopted, they voted for their state legislators who then voted for, chose the senators from their state. Now, Madison's original idea was to have a very small body with one senator per state. But that will have to change, and we'll get to that. I'm sorry, my apologies, scratch that. I misspoke that, that was wrong. He thought there should be by population in both houses. My apologies, this is really important. I can't believe I missaid that. He thought that the bigger states deserved more representatives in both bodies. Madison's idea was the House of Representatives will have more people from each of the bigger states and fewer people from the smaller states. But his original idea was the Senate would be that way too. It would be a smaller body, but the big states would still have more senators than the smaller states in Madison's plan. And there will be a hue and cry out of the small states. The New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Rhode Island didn't even come. They pitched a fit about this. Said, you big states are trying to bully us around. In the new federal government, we won't have any power at all because we're little states. And they were demanding that the article's original unicameral body with just one vote per state be kept. In the end they will come up with what's known as the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise will accept the basics of Madison's Virginia plan, but make one crucial change. The Senate will have the same number of senators from every state. This was to make the little states happy. Virginia and New, ha New Jersey and Pennsylvania were big, sorry, Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania were big states in population, but they will have the same number of senators that little states like Delaware and New Hampshire had. In the House of Representatives, the big states get more people. But in the Senate, under the Great Compromise, there will be an equal number of senators from every state. And how many senators would that be? Two. Each state gets two senators. Now, they did keep Madison's idea about the state legislatures choosing the senators, two senators from each state, and that will stay in force until 1913. The Constitution will be changed in 1913 to allow the voters to choose their senators as well as to choose their House of Representatives members directly. So they are just still electing two senators from each state, but now we vote for them directly. So Senator John Cornyn is being opposed by M.J. Hagar, uh, the Democratic candidate. He, uh, Cornyn's a Republican. And the people of Texas will vote in November or early in October uh, to determine which of those two 
will be one of our two senators in Washington. But everybody in Texas will vote on their local House of Representatives member. Here in Bedford, that's the 24th district. It's an open seat this time. There's a Democrat and Republican running, and nobody is the incumbent. Nobody has the advantage of incumbency in this district, 24th District of Texas, right now. So it should be a very interesting race in our local race. Okay. The other thing I wanted to tell you was the difference between the Senate and the House they worked out. Senators will be chosen every six years. Senators serve six-year terms. They don't want them looking at political factors all the time. They want them to be able to think about things without worrying about, oh, I've got to be chosen again soon. I better keep an eye on what's popular. They wanted them to be less worried about popularity. So senators, older, older people, 30 years and older, uh, then chosen by the state legislatures, now chosen by the voters, but even still today, they serve six-year terms. The House of Representatives are meant to be closer to the people. The founders wanted them to worry about popular opinion. They wanted them to be responsive to the voters. So they have to be elected, all of them, every two years. Every two years, every member of the House of Representatives has to stand for re-election. Every two years. Six years versus two years. That's why. They wanted the House to be close to the people. Last thing to say is, obviously, if every state gets two, how many senators are there today? 100. 50 states times two, 100 senators. But remember, the House is supposed to be from smaller districts, and the big states get more members of the House, the little states get fewer. Every state is entitled to one representative. But Texas has 38 representatives right now in the Congress, because we're a big state. But that means that there are going to be a lot more representatives than there are senators. There are 435. 435. Know that. 100 senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives. Six-year terms in the Senate, two-year terms in the House. Today, both are directly elected. Back in the early days, the senators were chosen by the legislatures. Um, so... That's the great compromise. The little states were pacified, got them on board by agreeing the Senate, they'd have just as much power as the big guys. Two senators from every state. We'll continue on Thursday with a live lecture. Complete your worksheet. Bye.